Well, first of all, uh, I'd just like to start off by thanking you all for attending. There were some pretty good sessions uh, up against this one, and it's the morning session, which means if it was me, I probably wouldn't have made it actually to my own session. But uh, since I'm giving the talk, I didn't have much choice. Um, so Ruby Waves is a, you know, another, yet another framework. I think hopefully as we go through this, you'll see that uh, it uh, has some different twists over, you know, uh, what some of the other frameworks are offering and a different angle and approach to the problem. Uh, and, you know, and that's really what I'm trying to uh, kind of get across in this talk is if I had to pick one thing, it's that it's, a, it's more of an architectural framework than an applications framework, and the focus is really around resource-oriented architecture, which I think is an extremely, and we've seen the emergence of, you know, REST as a paradigm, people talking about service-oriented architecture, and about, you know, REST and, and RESTful applications, and that's because there's a lot of power to that paradigm, and, and WAVE's objective really is as it's grown up is to sort of help you, help developers in general take better advantage and write more truly resource oriented applications uh, with, with fewer obstacles to doing so. Before I get into to some of that, let me quickly just introduce myself. My name is Dan Yoder. I work with uh, AT&T Interactive R&D out in uh, Los Angeles, which is a lot of fun. Like a lot of people, we're really desperate for really elite Ruby programmers, so I'll leave my pitch at that, but it's a great place to work. Uh, some, of the, some of the things that we've been working on, a lot of interesting things around the Ruby community, uh, mobile development. Uh, and uh, rich client interfaces. So if, if you have a kind of an R&D bent and uh, you like really nice weather, you know, get in touch. <clears throat> so that's me. And uh, so let's just dive in. So this diagram I think is a really cool diagram. Uh, well, not the diagram itself, but the historical significance of it. It was uh, Apparently, one of the first uh, attempts by Tim Berners-Lee to describe the, uh, the architecture of the web as he envisioned it, uh, I'm not sure what the date, if this is circa like 93 or 94 or exactly where it was, uh, but, but one thing about it, uh, and it's just neat because it's got you know, some sort of historical significance, but one thing that's really interesting about it is that it, it's not an MVC architecture. And if you follow, and most of you in this room, uh, you know, and, and it's even a little intimidating talking about this because it's a learning process for me, uh, you know, are probably aware that there's really a whole very rich architectural domain and uh, a lot of thought that was put in to the architecture of the World Wide Web. And in fact, uh, although some of the success of the web is probably a little bit accidental and good timing and some of those other things, the more you dig, the more you realize how much thought was really put into to some of these things that, you know, at a casual glance can seem like they just sort of popped up as ad hoc solutions to problems. And for those of you who've read uh, Roy Fielding's thesis on REST, you know, he was also a major influencer on the HTTP specification that we use today, uh, and a lot, of, a lot of those things in there really were uh, attempts to sort of round out an architectural framework, really, or, or as they call it, a style, which is uh, also an important distinction. We'll focus on the web and HTTP mostly in this talk, uh, but it's not obviously limited to those things. Now, because of the power of resource-oriented architecture, if you want to kind of get a feel for, you know, we've already seen the vast success of the World Wide Web, but what we're also seeing now is the emergence more and more of running everything in the cloud, even databases, running, uh, you know, all of your, you know, doing uh, Amazon EC2 type of things. 
things are moving more and more into the cloud and uh, we also see lots and lots of APIs every week there's new announcements from Yahoo or Google uh, or you know hopefully in the future from AT&T Interactive as well about um, you know new APIs that you can consume in the cloud without having to really actually you know, go out and you know, buy something, install it and configure it. You just point into web service, get your credentials, whatever, and uh, there you go. <clears throat> so the next question though is that a lot of people ask, you know, you say, well, you know, because people are always asking you this when you do something kind of silly like try to write your own framework. Uh, you know, well why? Why would I do this? Why would I use it? And, you know, you can say resource oriented all day, but for a lot of people it comes a lot more down to well, what, what does that really bind me? Why are my apps running better? And the real answer is that you're leveraging what the web has already figured out. All of this thought that's gone into how do you do massive scaling with all kinds of disparate systems, many of which have different underlying semantics or assumptions about the way that they're expecting uh, to, to, to operate. And the way that this all works is, is you know, widely known as sort of loosely coupling and making sure that, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of tolerance in the way that, that uh, everything comes together. And that's where the scalability comes. So resource-oriented architecture, scalability. If you're looking at an architecture and you're evaluating it based on its openness and its standards, compliance, and so on, you know, the web can, the resource oriented architecture and the web sort of offers that as well. Over a thousand APIs are now out there published on a programmable web. This is a screenshot from last night that I took. So, you know, there's a lot of examples that reuse and packaging services uh, for other people to consume is really working. It's an idiom that can work not only for big companies like an Amazon or a Google, but internally for the things that you're working on. So, you know, we're talking about scalability, we're talking about open standards, we're talking about reuse. And then maybe one of the biggest things that's easy to overlook is just this amazing amount of infrastructure that is already in place that will help you. Edge caching, uh, proxy servers, a lot of very mature, stable technology that has been tested and proven to be robust. So when you're looking again at an architectural idiom or an architectural style, resource oriented makes the most sense. But again, you know, a lot of web apps are really starting with MVC and then trying to make it and adapt it to be more resource oriented. And Waves is kind of flipping that around, saying there's so much value in resource oriented architecture, we should be starting with resource-oriented architecture and then layering on the pieces that we specifically need in a given context. So the next question then comes up, well that's fine, I, I can understand that, but, and I'm not going to try to get into a purist definition. This isn't really a definition up here uh, because, you know, I don't, I don't know for sure. I mean, there's a lot of people that are, uh, you know, people like Roy Fielding and Mark Baker that take a pretty uh, rigid stance on what qualifies as a, you know, as a, a, a true resource-oriented application or API. Um, but I think, you know, like with a lot of things, I mean, there's sort of a pragmatic aspect of this. If you do most of these things pretty well, you're probably going to start to gain a lot of the benefits over time of a resource-oriented architecture. Uh, one of the things that is probably worth sort of pointing out, one of the things that I, at least I, I struggled to understand is the importance of the content negotiation aspect of it. It's something that's only recently begun to really get, uh, you know, the attention that it deserves over the last year or two. Uh, and uh, so this is things like, you know, checking to see what, what's the content type and actually not just assuming that the content type and the accept headers that are being passed in by the client uh, in the request are what you were expecting, but actually, you know, just saying, look, I know that there's a bunch of standard content types and I'm going to start trying to develop around the possibility that I may have clients connecting later on that will use them. They're standard media types 
that in many cases they're not hard to support or add the support for it. So why not just do it and, and you know, have you know, the logic to, to, to go through. And, and, and this is a great example of where frameworks like Waves can help because there's actually sort of a complex little algorithm about proceeding through the possible things that the client's saying that they can accept and picking the one that they prefer. Uh, it's sort of the least common denominator algorithm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's quite a powerful specification, but it's, it's not in wide use. And one of the goals of Waves is, again, to make that a little bit more accessible to developers so that uh, it's not as painful to, to do this. Now, like I said, I'm going to start really and zero in mostly on HTTP as, uh, as the focal point, although, again, you can imagine uh, a, a framework and waves over time, I think, will begin to support other schemes besides HTTP and HTTPS. But HTTP has the advantage of being a great case study because it's, it's really one of the only protocols that was really designed around or with resource-oriented architecture in mind. So somewhere in the, I forget which section, it's like 5.1 or something in the HTTP specification, there's a line that basically says that HTTP is about methods calling uh, or operating on a resource. If you're a Rubyist, you're thinking methods on a resource, hey, you know, I need a resource class and I define some methods and there I go, right? So it looks something like this in a naive implementation. You know, I just instantiate a resource based on a request and then I start calling the methods on it and the methods sort of look at the request and figure out what to do. The only problem with this is that, you know, if you've, you know, as everybody knows, look at this, I mean, this is an incredibly naive uh, example. I mean, most of the time it's, it's much more complicated than this and, you know, you'd end up with, you know, I'm going to make sure I don't fall off here a whole list of these things and, and that's where things like Rails routing has come in and so on to try to make that more manageable. Waves takes a different approach to trying to solve the problem and says let's, let's keep the idea of a resource class with methods intact. And in fact, you know, let's look at the whole request because requests uh, in HTTP are extremely, it's a real very rich specification actually. There's, caching, the content types, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the URI, the, the type of the body. And we can look at this in a way it, it, as a method signature. Now Ruby doesn't really have these kinds of method signatures. Ruby is very loose and flexible and that's partly why we all love it. Because uh, you can do a lot of really crazy things in Ruby. Uh, but if we just take a step back and kind of put our, our computer scientist hats back on for a second and think of an HTTP request as having a signature, and let's take, uh, I'm not funny enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, I, when, I, when you do these slides, I mean, you always have these like jokes and then you get a little bit intimidated and nervous and, and I forget to tell mine, but he's got it down. So all your jokes. That's it. That's it. I was about to tell that one. <laughs> Philosophy must be very funny. I, yeah, well, that was the thing. I, when I saw that talk, I thought, man, that, that's, a, that's a compelling talk. I, I need to put something about Plato maybe in my next talk. Anyway, so this, if you're familiar with the notion of, as, as I'm sure you, you are, uh, of method signatures or function signatures, this looks, if we take get as an example, and we say, look, you know, it's got a, it's got a, a content type, right, that uh, it's saying, hey, this is, this is what, um, you know, I'm requesting. Um, these are the formats that will accept it. Here's some options that I would uh, like to pass on in. And you know, you could do that for put, post, delete, and so on. But in, in Ruby, we don't really have, uh, we don't really have those kinds of method signatures. We don't have method overloading. 
And so, in a somewhat weird kind of convergence thing where you realize, uh, you know, I, all this was sort of implemented backwards, you know, of implementing things just for kicks and then realizing, wait a minute, now I can solve this other problem. Uh, and it's actually, a, there's probably a whole thing about how Ruby being fun causes you to go experiment and then discover whole idioms or paradigms that you, you wouldn't have actually thought about if you were trying to be too analytical about it and get your design correct up front. So Functor is a gem that I just on a whim, a guy named Topher Sill, I don't know, he's written a book, has some really interesting blog posts. I don't know if you guys have heard of him, but you should look him up. Uh, it's like Christopher, but without the Chris. And uh, he wrote this thing called um, Multi, this neat little gem called Multi, which provided multi-method dispatch or sort of an overloading pattern, argument pattern-based matching. I took that idea and I sort of just kept adding to it. And to understand a little bit about how Waves does things, it's important to kind of briefly go into what Functor is. So this is kind of the canonical functional programming example implementing the Fibonacci sequence using pattern matching on the arguments. So in the Fibonacci sequence, you know, 0 and 1 are, are sort of seeding the, uh, the function. And then from there on, we just take an integer. And that's actually not quite correct because that could be a negative number. But uh, we take that and we just, you know, implement the Fibonacci sequence in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, the function itself. So kind of recursively there. So that's an example of how you would define a functor object using the functor library. But you can also define functor methods and this is where you start to see the tie-in because I can implement the same kind of logic that we were talking about before, um, but now I've got pattern matching in the mix. Now here all I'm doing in this example is I'm just pattern matching apparently on the path. That's what, that's what this is implying. And so I can actually now have a couple of different get methods and different post methods that are operating on different resources or paths and returning whatever. Um, does that make sense to everybody? Okay, cool. Uh, now, so then we build a little further from there and we define a notion of a request functor, which is just a, uh, a functor that we define, a functor method on a resource that's intended to match a request. Nothing, nothing too terribly tricky about it. And then on that, uh, we add to that because of the fact that, as I, as I noted earlier, requests in HTTP, it's a very rich, expressive little, little DSL, really, that's there. And so we need a little bit more than just matching on the path. And so we add uh, some DSL features that make it possible to do that using built on functor, these will just generate, these DSLs will just generate functors, which in turn are really actually just methods, and I'll show that in a little bit. So now here's, uh, here's what it actually looks like, and again, this is still a very simplified example, just kind of building up here to the, to the complex part. And I'm saying, look, on a get method, if the path says name, return, return Fido, because all of the dog resources apparently are named Fido. The other thing we've done here is we've dispensed with a little bit of bookkeeping and mixed in a bunch of helper methods with this, with this mix-in from Waves, which, uh, you know, generally you put in, you don't have to, but then you'd have to do all that stuff yourself. Now, Waves, again, is an architectural framework, so there's a lot of things where, hey, this is, this is the way that we're doing it, but you might well think of a better way to do it or have a different spin on things or add in different helpers. Uh, we have a layer called uh, MVC, which mixes in a bunch of MVC helpers in addition. So just to kind of give you an idea of the flexibility, it's an architectural framework. Um, we do have a, there is a, well, I'll get to that in a second. So, so here we have a simple example. Let's look at a little bit more complicated example. So it's the same basic idea. Here I'm matching on a, 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 a URL that consists of, you know, slash location. But it's also saying you need to pass me two query parameters, a lat and a long, and those need to be four digits long. 
So if that regex doesn't match in the second line there for those query parameters, that, uh, that, actual, that actual request functor is not going to be run. So this way I can overload on the query parameters. I can also overload on the accept header. So if you're familiar with, uh, I think some of the other frameworks use the thing where you, you, know, you check it and you sort of have, okay, if it was this format, then do this, and this format, then do that. In, in ways, what you would actually do is for each of the different formats, you might specify different functors uh, to, to, actually, to actually handle that kind of scenario so that they're, they're just distinct request functor methods. So there's a lot more to request DSLs. We're documenting frantically. We just pushed out the 081 release of Waves uh, actually this morning. And uh, so there's a lot of things you can do. You can do most of the typical things you'd expect, capturing path components, matching them against regular expressions. You can also do kind of wildcard matching, saying, you know, match against zero or to n or zero to one to n or even one to three components if you know that it's specifically going to be three units. But uh, so there's a lot of flexibility there. You can do path generation, sort of like name paths and rails. So there's a lot there. Uh, the documentation and some tutorials and so forth, some sample apps are actually on the website. So I'm not going to try to go through each one of these examples because there's a lot of possible combinations. But the main thing to think about here is that this is really a DSL intended ultimately. It does not at this time, still 0 0.8, and we're still, we're still building out some of this. But it's intended to be able to match against the entire range uh, of, of possible requests that can be expressed in HTTP. And that's sort of the key to being able to write truly resource-oriented apps is to really take that request seriously uh, and inspect it and do interesting things with it. But at the end of the day, just to kind of hammer this point home, all we've done is define methods on a resource, just like, well, it's actually instance methods on a resource class, but it's, it's pretty closely, it's about as close of an analogy to HTTP as you can get in Ruby, or, well, it might not be, but it's as close as I've been able to figure out how to get it. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna overstate our success there. But if you, if you look at this, here we're just saying, hey, you know, let me check to see if I actually have a method called get, put, post, delete on my story resource. This is from an actual sample app that you can find in my uh, GitHub. I'm D. Yoder on GitHub, and you, there's a, an app there called Pages, which is an open source CMS based on multi-tenant CMS based on waves. And uh, so this is, an, this is actually code I ran just to demonstrate that that actually is really just creating uh, methods on a resource. Now, each application typically is going to need to handle more than one resource. And this is, I think, a big advantage of the resource-oriented model with Waves, the way it works. And I'll get into why in a second. But it's important to understand that there, there is the typical, unless you have a very, very simple app, which I'll show you one in a minute, unless you have a really simple app, usually you're going to have a lot of different resources. And it's not that different from having a lot of different controllers or models in an MVC type of framework. So you're not, you know, unless it's a really simple app, you're not just going to have the one resource that's going to handle everything. You're going to have an, a, a bunch of resources. And the way this is done is that there is a sort of proxy resource for the entire application that sort of says to the, to the web, if you will, look, I represent all of these other resources. I'm their agent. And so if you want to get a hold of them, you know, send the request to me and I'll make sure that they get the message. And what these, these proxy resources, and for historical reasons and waves, they ended up being called maps by convention. You don't have to call them that, but that's what you'll see a lot. Because uh, we used to have one big, what we call, it was like our routing files, a big map file. And then we realized, wait a minute, we can break this into pieces. So what we do is, 
you know, we say, hey, you know, just look at enough of the request that you can figure out where this guy goes. So, for example, uh, I might actually look at uh, the first component of the path, and that will tell me, that kind of will tip me off which resource I'm going to. Uh, it could be a subdomain matching, because again, we can match on anything in the request, or we're getting there. We can definitely match on domains today. So I could say, well, if it's this subdomain, it's actually going to this resource, or if it's this path component. So I'm trying to do like, you know, just enough. I don't want to look too much because, you know, then I slow things down. I want to look just enough to figure out where I'm delegating this to. And then I'll send it off to something that actually does a little bit more detailed inspection of the request. Now, that structure is a little weird and takes a little bit of getting used to and we had a lot of back and forth and arguing about whether or not moving away from the more conventional notion of just having all of this stuff kind of in one place was good or bad. And I'm going to try to convince you uh, that it was a good decision. There, there's three main reasons. One is that resources are just ordinary classes, so now I can do things like inheritance or mix in things. I can leverage the full expressive power that Ruby gives me to, to sort of support reuse and good modular encapsulated code design. Right? I'm not, it's not a special kind of construct, they're just, they're just methods on resource classes. Instance methods on resource classes. So, now I have inheritance and, and all of the power of Ruby if I want to use it or mix-ins. The other thing is, if any of you have ever dealt with large, you know, applications in Rails, I mean, or, or any other uh, kind of route-based framework, uh, you know, one of the things that happens after a while is it starts to get really, really difficult because you get enough of these things in your app and it's hard to know where to insert the new one in or you know, uh, you know exactly where, which, which thing is matching that request. I mean, you have to sort of go through the whole thing. By breaking this down and, and following just, you know, basic software design principles for this, we get really quickly to the point where, you know, hey, we've got five or ten uh, request functors in a resource, a typical resource, or 15. I mean, you, and you use the same metrics that you would use with any class to say, well, maybe we need to actually further decompose this resource into multiple pieces so that it's a little bit easier to understand what's going on. And then accidentally out of this, uh, we actually picked up a little bit of a performance benefit because if I go back through this picture real quick, uh, the map actually will take a look at a handful, like in this case I'd probably have four four uh, actual request functors in my map trying to figure out where to route things. And then so I've made it most, you know, on average probably two or three comparisons there. And then I only have, you know, a handful in each one of these. So instead of if I had maybe a hundred or fifty of these uh, routes in a normal routing situation, I'm actually only, and I might on average say look at if I tuned it just right, I might be able to get it down to an average of like 30 comparisons when I'm doing my matching. In this case, I'm actually only going to match on, you know, eight or something like that. A few in the, in the, uh, del the, the proxy, the map resource, and then a few more uh, in the actual resource that I'm delegating to. Uh, also, I'm a little bit remiss here not talking a little bit more about the notion of foundations and layers. So, as I said, it's an architectural framework for resource-oriented architecture. Waves is. So, here's an example. This is a very simple example of what I'm talking about. We mix in a bunch of stuff, the sort of bare minimum that it takes to run a Waves app in what's called a foundation. And so we've got foundations, we've got layers. A layer is just a module, basically, that overrides the included method and then goes to town in many cases. It has license at that point to pretty much, if you're including a layer in an application, it may even be modifying the Waves framework, taking full advantage of the fact that you have open classes and so on. Now, a foundation is just a layer that says, look, I guarantee you I'll, do the, I'll bring in 
to the execution environment exactly the things that you need to really run a Waves application. And Compact is sort of the minimal version of that, right? So in this version, we just say, look, this is bringing in a configuration. It's sort of setting up our map to begin with. And then we add a simple hello world rule. And, and that, that's, that's hello world in Waves, basically. And what we're really trying to do here is say, look, we want you to have the ability to do resource oriented. We want to try to take the, the obstacles away from doing that and make it more natural to express re resource oriented uh, uh, architectural implementations uh, in, in your applications. But at the same time, I mean, we don't want to kind of restrict it to that and say, well, that's all you're allowed to do. So the layers and foundations essentially provide a way for you to then pick and choose the features that you really want to include in your application container. And we're decoupling that from the way that the, the, resource, uh, the resources are handling the requests. So for example, we have an MVC layer that kind of comes in and adds some additional helpers to the, uh, to the uh, request function, to the resource so that you can use them in your request functors to call out to models and controllers uh, very simply. So here's an example of how that would work. This is a slightly simplified version of what we call the classic, classic being you know, more around uh, you know, what, what uh, the idioms that Rails and Sun MVC have established. And one important point to look at, well there's two really, uh, the first one is that we're saying, hey, listen, um, <clears throat> we're only going to load the code that you need, you know, at the time that you ask for it. So all this stuff isn't sort of all into Waves cores when it, when it comes up. If you don't use it, if you don't use the layers, you don't pay for it. You don't increase the size of your app's footprint because you you know, just don't happen to need inflection in that application. Now as a little sidebar, just the last couple of days, one of the things uh, one of my colleagues came up with uh, is this thing called Hoshi that you should definitely check out. And uh, it's a new, it's kind of a Markaby-like, but it takes some of the things that are tricky about Markaby and takes them out. The classic foundation today does not use Hoshi, but uh, I put it in there just for fun. We will probably have it in there shortly. <clears throat> if you go to, uh, well, I, uh, I think I have a link here later. Um, if you go to GitHub slash Pete, I think you'll find the, um, the, the, the project there in the source. And it'll be released as a gem hopefully shortly. Very cool stuff. So then the next thing we do is we include those layers into the application and in turn they go do their thing. So this guy is obviously really just sort of a composite layer. It doesn't really have a whole lot uh, that it's doing. Like I said, this is a little bit simplified. Here we're basically layering in some of the intelligent code reloading features. Uh, note on that, you know, you can, you can it takes a little bit of learning, but if you study the way that the uh, classic foundation is set up, you'll notice how the code reloading is totally configurable. So if you don't particularly want to have a directory, say, called views, and you want to call it, you know, templates, or you want to call it foobar, you can actually set that up so that the app knows to load, you know, foobars from the foobar directory. It's, it's all, there's a whole DSL for setting that stuff up, and that's what that autocode guy does. And we're bringing in MVC and inflection and some helpers for the views and so on. Those aren't the only features. Those are the big picture features. I know the description of the talk said I was going to walk through an app, but I still feel like I'm at the point of kind of introducing people to what we're doing that's a little different. I could do the five minute blog demo, but A, most of you have seen variations of that by now probably 30 times. And B, we have those, I mean, there's a sample blog app that's in the, the if, you, if you install the gem and then you go look in the samples directory there, you'll see a blog app and 
and we're going to have a whole bunch of sample apps coming out. Um, well, there, Pages is one of them. If you go to my repo and look at Pages, you'll see one. Uh, so there's, there's some sample apps coming out, and hopefully between that and some tutorials that we're, you know, are still in progress, but that are rapidly kind of coming online, uh, there'll be enough for you to be able to walk through building an app and picking even which sort of flavor of, of app you want to experiment with. So, uh, you know, obviously I'm not going to be able to go through that in the remaining time, but one feature here that I kind of want to emphasize that, that is a subtle one and it's a little bit difficult to, to talk about because there's not any specific thing that it does, but throughout Waves, and hopefully if you were looking at the source code, you would start to see this, is a, a desire to try to think before implementing something, how does Ruby already implement this? So Layers is a great example of that where we realize there's already an included hook for modules that, that gives you pretty much a license to go do anything. And once you're in there, you know you've just been included, you know, you can, uh, you can go crazy. And so there was no need for us to think in terms of, okay, do we need a component API or a plugin API or something? All the pieces in Ruby are generally there. Inheritable configurations is another thing. We just define basically accessor methods for configuration values on a class. And since class uh, methods are inheritable, that works out great. You can have a whole tree of configurations if you have a really complex set of deployment scenarios. You know, no big deal. You can just, whatever's changing in each one of those, you can inherit from, you know, uh, higher, more abstract, uh, you know, development becomes, you know, development and then subclassed into test and maybe production has, you know, QA or staging and so on. So everywhere in Waves we're trying to make use of what Ruby already does because that's the main point of the whole thing. The whole reason I, I you know, uh, the whole reason I, code in Ruby is because I love what Ruby does. I, and not, so the framework's trying to stay out of the way as much as possible. So this is my nephew who just had his first Halloween. And that's how I feel about waves. You know, we're, we're just getting going. We've got our little rocket scooter. You know, we're feeling, we've got our, you know, our little costume on. We're feeling pretty sexy and ready to go. Now that said, uh, we have a long ways to go, uh, and we're definitely interested in, uh, there's a lot of things on the roadmap. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to keep, if you go to rubywaves.com slash roadmap, you can see sort of the things that we're looking at working on. We have sort of a planned monthly release schedule that'll be coming out. If there's things on there that you're particularly interested in doing, you know, let me know because uh, you know there's there's plenty of uh, you know plenty of help needed to get all those things done, and the more people that are kind of involved in it, the better. So far, I mean, we've had some people come in and out, a lot of really good contributors, but the main thing about it is that they, uh, you know, every one of them I think has even if it wasn't something that's still sitting there, and their their legacy isn't always in the code. It's in the code that we rewrote <laughs> because they had ideas that were better than the ones that we started with. So I won't go through this, the whole roadmap here, but this is kind of a, a snapshot of the things that we're planning on working on. And one of the things that I found by focusing more on resource oriented as an architectural paradigm that needs more support uh, within the Ruby framework world is that it seems to be taking us into implementing features that are a little bit neglected or there's not a lot of things done around them. You know, uh, there's a thing called Rack Cache which just came out which is a, ca a rack middleware. Waves uses Rack if I didn't mention that. And uh, you know, it, it does a nice job of, of beginning to implement uh, HTTP caching properly so that you can just leverage the Rack Cache uh, module. So this stuff is starting to happen, but the fact that there wasn't a rack cache module to begin with kind of gives you an idea of, you know, we're maybe getting into uh, new territory. So I apparently have to wrap up. I'm, ta I'm, I'm taking all my cues from this guy. I got to go sit down with him, have him coach me. So we. What's the, uh, no. <laughs> 
I guess that's good that it's not a relative, but uh, <laughs> I have no idea who she is, though, so she doesn't even know my name. You have to have the one gratuitous photo. And with a name like Waves, I mean, I haven't, I've only begun to scratch the surface of what's possible uh, with, with, with the imagery. So there, we're on GitHub, we're on Google Groups and Ruby Waves, which uh, we do, I, you know, we check all the time. It's not terribly active because mostly we're on Freenode.net uh, Waves, the Waves channel. So we're, I'm on there every day. We've usually got two or three people at least sort of on there answering questions and, and arguing about, you know, why my last commit was stupid. Um, and then the website, rubywaves.com. So, you know, that's basically it. I, wouldn't, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to some of the folks. Uh, uh, Krishna over here, some areas, he yeah. Uh, Pete Elmore, uh, some of my, one of, a couple of my colleagues at 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 and T Interactive, uh, and a number of other folks, uh, Nano Rails, uh, Lawrence Pitt, who's Copa Waves, uh, who've all done a great job. Just like I said, I mean, they've left a lot of of uh, great ideas that are now baked into Waves because of their feedback. So with that, um, I, I, hope, I hope you came away with a better idea of what Waves does and you'll check it out and, and maybe uh, you know, play around with some of the stuff and give us some feedback and maybe get involved. So if, thank you.